uh, okay, sorry about that. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another edition of our fireside chats. Uh, I am okay. That is not meant to happen. Sorry about that. Uh, I am Pallavi. Uh, I am the co-founder of Asian Pathfinders along with Shreyas Deshmukh. Sorry, my laptop's being weird right now. But uh, so as you know, Asian Pathfinders escape. Sorry, I'm going to stick to just this style today. Uh, so we are Asian Pathfinders. We are a knowledge sharing platform. And uh, as you are, a lot of you know, we hold these sessions every Saturday. One is uh, our fireside chats and also the dialogues, which are held every Thursday. Uh, sorry, every alternate Thursdays. And uh, so our next sessions are going to be on cybersecurity, as I was earlier saying, mm -hmm. and also on India-China. Uh, the whole aim about in Asian Pathfinders coming into being is to be that platform where we can get very diverse voices from scholars, academics, practitioners uh, to come and have these discussions because having promoting this uh, multidisciplinary dialogue is very important, I guess, because we live in a very interconnected world. So uh, do reach out to us if you have any suggestions of speakers or any sessions you'd like to hear from us. So that would be great uh, because this is also a platform for you to engage in. We really keep it as informal as possible, as a lot of you do know. So like I said, our upcoming sessions. Uh, so we have very interesting sessions coming up. Uh, next week itself, we have one on India's cybersecurity landscape, uh, how it uh, is going to look for 2021 as well as beyond. Uh, we also have Professor Shrikant Kondapalli uh, on Saturday, next Saturday who's going to look out for the outlook for India-China relations in 2021. Uh, post that, uh, we have two very interesting fireside chats. We have Advocate Preet Bhaseen speaking on data privacy and information governance landscape in India. And I think given the whole uh, controversy and issues around WhatsApp and everything that's come up in the recent weeks, I think this is very important. And uh, for the ones who do not know, uh, Advocate Bhaseen is one of the... Uh, top or one of the major voices for cyber law in India. So uh, if you've not read her work, please do read. She does really write very good articles on these topics. Just Google her, she's there. Uh, and also, uh, as India is undergoing a lot of assembly elections this year from West Bengal to Assam, uh, we thought we'll get a political scientist to see how this all fits in the political outlook of India. So we have Dr. Suhas Pershikar for that. Uh, that is on February 6th. Uh, we'll be sending all the details in email or it will be on our social media. So you can check that. In terms of the community guidelines, uh, just keep it open, guys. Please express your views. Please uh, talk about it. Uh, but definitely... Uh, Use parliamentary languages, uh, respect intellectual property, do not post defamatory content. Uh, we all have views. We all come from different walks of life. So we all are bound to have our own different views, but respect the views of each other. So that's basic. Uh, how do you contact us? So you can find me and Shreyas as well as Asian Pathfinders on various social medias. So moving on to today's session, uh, we have uh, Dr. Ashok Bahiria, who will be the speaker today. And... Our co-founder, Shreyas Deshmukh, is the moderator. So Shreyas no, needs no introduction, especially for the regulars of Asian Pathfinders, but just a brief. Uh, along with being uh, the co-founder of Asian Pathfinders, he's a research associate at Delhi Policy Group, uh, which is based in uh, Delhi, uh, in, uh, and where he looks at the Afghanistan-Pakistan region. Uh, he's re looked at this region for the last few years now. Uh, he's also worked with uh, Bitcat Advisory Services uh, as a geopolitical analyst, as well as the MPIDSA from where uh, Behuria Sir comes. So over to you, Shres. Thank you, Pallavi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And welcome you all for today's session on India-Pakistan relations in 2021, analyzing the status quo. Uh, to speak on the topic, we have Dr. Ashok Behuria. And Dr. Behuria is a fellow and coordinator of South Asia Center at uh, MPIDSA. Pakistan relations for his PhD. He joined IDSA in 2003, and before that, he worked as an assistant director at International Center for Peace and Studies at New Delhi. 
He has also been editor of international studies, the prestigious, prestigious research journal from Jawaharlal Nehru University, and has been in the editorial board of Journal of Peace Studies and Strategic Analysis, the flagship journal from MPIDSA. He has taught at the University of Delhi and Jamia Millia Islamia as a close observer of developments in South Asia. And he has been awarded the prestigious K. Subramanyam Award for Excellence in Strategic Studies for his work on Pakistan in 2009. Uh, besides this, he is a mentor to many students of South Asian studies. Whatever little knowledge uh, I have gained in this field in the last seven years, just because he has given me the opportunity by accepting my internship application in 2013. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for those kind words. <clears throat> now, coming back to today's topic, uh, uh, the topic of today's discussion doesn't require opening remarks. Initially, I thought I'll give some opening remarks, but like most of us are aware about the developments between India and Pakistan in the last uh, one, one and a half year, but mostly most of us know about the relation, how it is going since uh, 1947. Due to the difficult neighborhood, India have to interact with them on all fronts. Geographically, we have multi-confrontations. Information warfare is going on on international level at low, uh, and uh, internally as well. Trade relations and people-to-people -people contacts. So there is a lot on plate vis-a-vis uh, -vis the today's uh, discussions. So I won't take much time and I'll just hand it over to sir for his remarks. Then we will go for the question and answer session. Please do, your, uh, please do share your questions in the chat box. And I will ha uh, I'll have my own questions also, sir, after, the, after your remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Actually, you people are younger than me and you are more uh, social media savvy. So you must be picking up a lot of things which I may not be looking at that closely. Uh, but let me uh, begin with a disclaimer that I come from a think tank which is fully funded by the government of India and Ministry of Defense. Uh, but my views are mine. It has got nothing to do with my institute or the government of India. So with that disclaimer, let me start. Uh, today you have asked me to focus on India-Pakistan relations in 2021 and what are the trends, what are the prospects. And all of you know, as much as I do, uh, things are not uh, looking up as far as India-Pakistan relationship is concerned. <clears throat> we all know uh, things have uh, nosedived uh, since uh, early 2019. And especially after uh, the Valentine Day attack in Pulwama on 14th of February, uh, which uh, saw uh, a suicide bomber taking out uh, 40 of our security uh, personnel, uh, CRPF personnel. So right since that day, uh, things have really nosedived. And by 2019 also, the, the effort that was made by Prime Minister Modi to reach out to his counterpart in Pakistan had already collapsed. Uh, Prime Minister Modi came, uh, assumed office in 2014 June. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sarif of Pakistan had assumed office uh, exactly a year earlier in Pakistan. And he, when he came to power, he had told his countrymen that one of my first jobs as Prime Minister would be to repair relationship with India. And he uh, meant it when he said this. And uh, the way he conducted himself after that also gave credence to this belief that he was personally thinking of improving relationship between India and Pakistan. If you remember in 2014 June, when Prime Minister Modi uh, invited Sark countries to his swearing in ceremony, uh, the head, heads of states of Sark countries to his swearing in ceremony, uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sarif uh, made it to Delhi and attended the swearing and ceremony. And many of us thought that that was going to alter the texture of India-Pakistan relationship, but that was not to be. 
And ever since, you know, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif was not allowed to uh, do anything that will get the two countries closure. And all of us know why it happened. It happened because the shadow of the Pakistan army is so long and so dense that the civilian political leadership will not be able to do anything worthwhile to improve relationship with India. So that is something that we all know. Uh, keeping that in mind, uh, what I will do, I will give you some snapshots from the past because that will contextualize the relationship and that will help you understand the complexities involved in this relationship. You see, right from 1947, I would say that even before that, when during the freedom movement, uh, the Pakistan movement came into being. You know, since that time, you find the leadership of the Pakistan movement and the leadership of Congress, which was leading the freedom movement in India, they were at loggerheads. They were championing two different worldviews. There were two different ideologies. Congress advocated a Catholic approach where in all communities will come together and build a new India. Whereas Pakistan, were, Pakistan, the leaders of the Pakistan movement, they thought that Muslims will be at risk in a united India, because it will be Hindu majority India, which will drive the relationship. And you know what happened when there was a brief uh, moment when British thought that they could bring the two leadership together, it fell apart. They thought that they will work with, uh, make uh, Muslim League work with Congress and vice versa. This didn't happen. And that led to the Kolkata riots, if you remember, Noakhali and other places. And it was a bloody riot. And during that time, there was a governor who went on to become the governor general of Canada. His name was R.G. Cassie. He was an Australian, but uh, he was governor of Bengal, undivided Bengal at that point of time. He made a very interesting observation. He said, it seems nobody can stop Pakistan at the moment. And if the two different countries are coming up, I would like to tell you that the relationship between the two countries will be primarily uh, uh, you know, uh, driven by the relationship between the two principal communities in the subcontinent. So he meant that the pa Pakistan, the way it was going, is bound to develop a communal Islamist identity, whereas India will always advocate a secular uh, identity. And these two identities would continue to class in the days to come. But he said, that that will be the uh, relationship in the two principal communities, the Hindus and the Muslims. He had a communal, uh, it had a communal overturn, his analysis. Uh, but ha what happened afterwards uh, bore him out in a certain sense. In the sense, Pakistan continued to develop as a communal entity, as, a, as, a, as an Islamist entity. And that really uh, came in the way of better relationship between the two countries. Because every time that you talked about better relationship, Pakistan would revert to the issue of Kashmir and say that, you know, it is, an, it is, a, it is, a, it is a region in, inhabited by Muslims. And uh, because partition was, uh, partition did take place on the basis of communities, uh, this particular uh, chunk of territory should have been annexed to Pakistan or should have come to Pakistan. So ever since there has been a class and class of worldviews and Pakistan has been inordinately pressurizing India to focus only on the Kashmir issue. Uh, between 1947 and 1997, those 50 years, you will see a lot of things had happened. It's not that two hostile countries like India and Pakistan. People have called it enduring rivalry. The relationship is characterized by in enduring rivalry. I would say it is enduring hostility. This enduring hostility between the two countries has, uh, you know, in a way, uh, had its impact on the region as well. But what I would like to tell you now, that this en despite this enduring hostility, you will be surprised the kind of dialogue that has taken place between the two countries. Uh, in, in, other, uh, in other parts of the world, if the rivalry is so intense, you would find that people would not talk. 
But here, it is an, it is an interesting story that the two countries, the leaderships of two countries have communicated with each other for a long, long time. And in many ways, on many occasions. Uh, in fact, I am tempted to say that it is a kind of a sibling rivalry that is at operation between the two countries. And the sibling rivalries can get very bad at times. As you know, there are examples uh, in political families in India. Uh, but uh, I would say that, you know, that is something that strikes me that uh, if you go to people who go to Pakistan, they come out with very, very fond memories. And so uh, similar things happen when Pakistan is visit India as well. They go back with very uh, fond memories of uh, how they were treated, how they were taken care of, how people on the streets related to them. And same is the case with Indians traveling to Pakistan. So at a popular level, I think there is still something that can be used to cement the relationship between the two countries. But uh, unfortunately, the way the uh, state of Pakistan has uh, developed, it has become difficult for the people-to-people -people relationship to uh, come up as a, uh, uh, what do you say, a driver uh, for India-Pakistan relationship. Uh, so this is something that you should know. Second thing that you should know that during these 50 years between 1947 and 1997, because many of us, many of us, many of you not be knowing it, uh, India had done one thing that Pakistan had done one thing that is Kashmir is the core issue and we should discuss Kashmir first and other issues can follow. India had an approach that we should discuss all the issues pending between India and Pakistan, right? And this bilateral uh, mechanism came into play after 1972. After 1971 war, India and Pakistan signed a treaty, signed an agreement, and that 1971, uh, after this 1971 war, in the 1972, uh, uh, these two uh, countries came out with a stat joint statement, and that statement clearly indicated that we are not going to look for a third party for resolution of issues pending between the two countries, we will advocate a bilateral uh, way of uh, deciding it, uh, you know, resolving our uh, pending differences. So this bilateral thing kicked in only after 1972. Before that, Pakistan was always trying to take it to you. We, we, we had approached United Nations in 1947-48, but what had happened in 1947-48, uh, there were global um, you know, politics was a, of a different uh, kind altogether. Uh, the, 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 the US driven liberal world wanted India on its side. India tried to stay away from power blocks. We had a non aligned approach. And that is why in the United Nations Security Council debates on Kashmir, which was uh, renamed as India Pakistan question. Initially, it was Kashmir issue, but it was invasion of Pakistan. In, uh, on Kashmir, but gradually uh, the United Nations renamed it as India-Pakistan question. And this India-Pakistan question, if you look at it closely, that gradually there was a tilt, there was an inclination towards supporting the Pakistani stand. Even the 1948 uh, April resolution clearly stated that Pakistan will have to take out all its troops from uh, the occupied uh, territories. Uh, and only after that, there will be discussion on the plebiscite, but that was not to happen. So by 1951, 50, 50, India had realized that the United Nations had started uh, inclining towards Pakistan and they were taking Pakistan's objections very seriously and they were trying to modify the resolution and they were trying to pressurize India into accepting uh, the Pakistani position. So from that time onwards, India looked away in 1953, 51, 52, we had a democratic uh, way of uh, obtaining the wishes of the people of the valley. And they voted overwhelmingly in favor of uh, Sheikh Abdullah's National Conference Party, mm -hmm. which in turn uh, ac uh, uh, chose to support the idea of accession to India. So, and after that, India did, didn't Look, behind, look back at all. India thought that the, the popular opinion has been obtained and it has been sealed. 
and we are not going to look at, look at United Nations anymore. The Anmogi kept on functioning, but we looked away from uh, United Nations from then onwards. We should remember this. So between 1947 and 1950, when Pakistan was insisting on uh, uh, the issue of Kashmir, we were looking away from it. We always held that Kashmir is not a dispute. And after 1972, we, when we insisted that all the issues, like what are the, what are the issues uh, on the table? It is uh, Sar Creek, it is uh, Sia Chain, it is India-Pakistan people-to-people -people contact, cultural exchanges, um, trade and commerce, um, and, uh, and Kashmir issue and terrorism. From 1988-89, it has been terrorism. So these two countries had two different approaches in the sense India put emphasis on terrorism, Pakistan put emphasis on Kashmir, but India always said that all the issues should be discussed together. Pakistan said only Kashmir issues should be discussed ahead of other issues. But in 1997, they came down from their position as much as we came down from our position. We expressed our readiness to discuss the Kashmir issue. And Pakistan decided to climb down from its earlier position and decided to discuss Kashmir with all other issues together. So that is how the composite dialogue took place. 1997-98, the composite framework came up. In 1999, February, uh, Bajpayee went to Lahore and uh, you know what happened uh, because Nawaz Sarif was the prime minister at that point of time too. He uh, welcomed Bajpayee. They uh, sat down to uh, you know, putting this mechanism to work, component, composite dialogue mechanism, but the military of Pakistan didn't accept it. And that is how uh, finally Nawaz Sarif had to go. Now Musharraf came to power. I'm just rushing through in the Q&A session. If you ask me, I'll go into the details. And Musharraf, in his own way, from 1999 October when he came to power till uh, September or uh, July 2001, he made several efforts to convince India that let us throw this composite dialogue away and we should focus only on Kashmir. But we didn't accept it. And then you had 9-11. After 9-11, there was enormous pressure on uh, Pakistan to behave. And after that, in 2004, after five years of rejecting Nawaz Sarif's composite dialogue uh, framework, he accepted it. In 2004, January, Musharraf accepted it. And between 2004 and 2007, I think we have had a wonderful round of dialogues with Pakistan. We had dialogues at various levels. Some of them really made some progress. As you know, the cross LOC trade, cross LOC travel also came into operation. And you had you know, people coming and going. There were a lot of people to people exchange, uh, talks about trade and commerce also opened up. So a lot of things had happened. But in 2007, Musarab committed some political mis blunders there. He uh, rounded up the Chief Justice of Pakistan, there was a popular movement, he had to leave. And you had a civilian government coming in. The Benazir Bhutto was um, uh, assassinated during the process of uh, her campaign. Uh, then election was, was post-2008. Benazir Bhutto's party won the elections. And uh, they initially they had problems about uh, taking up this uh, relationship forward because uh, a military dictator was the author of this process. But gradually, by September, October, things had pitted out. They had started accepting it. And uh, in uh, uh, November, early November, you had uh, Jardari coming up in a Hindustan Times leadership uh, summit. So uh, in a virtual address to Indian media and Indian uh, audience, he said that, you know, I do not count India as a threat at all. And this no first use doctrine applies to India as well. We are not going to use nuclear weapons against India. So that was a huge, huge, mis a huge, huge, huge concession for a Pakistani politician to do. He was, he was um, asked by the army to shut up. He, he said, I am not going to retreat uh, from my position, but I will not say it again. But that is how it happened. And between 2008 and 2013, five years that he was in power, he made several moves to get closer to India. Uh, they wanted to, uh, his government wanted to give, Jadari government wanted to give us um, MFN status. Uh, that was not uh, acceptable to the army. It didn't happen. Five years of efforts 
uh, didn't succeed. Then you had Nawaz Sharif coming in. Nawaz Sharif tried his best to relate to India. He could not. You had Modi and Nawaz Sharif meeting uh, on several occasions. They met in, in uh, New Delhi first when during his swearing in ceremony. Then they met in um, what do you say Kathmandu. They met in COP 21 in Paris, and they met in uh, in, in in the Kathmandu. He they met. Uh, and secretly in a hotel uh, in Kathmandu and they discussed India-Pakistan issue. But somehow he had burnt his bridges with the military of Pakistan. That is why the relationship could not take uh, roots. And he, they, he could not uh, get us back on track. Uh, the relationship as it was obtained in, uh, the, in you know, the 2007 continue, continued after that. And when uh, they saw the back of Nawaz Sharif. I mean, Nawaz Sharif, uh, you know, because of the Panama scandal, he had to leave. And there was uh, people in Pakistan say that there was a judiciary, military, and certain element, political elements coming together to get him out of power. And once Nawaz Sharif was gone, Nawaz Sharif was uh, uh, in, in the next elections in 2018, uh, the the slogan was uh, Modi ka yaar gaddar gaddar. So Nawaz Sharif was rated as somebody who was very close to Modi. That is why he is a traitor to Pakistan. And uh, despite that, I must tell you, you know, you must, you know, your young, uh, young ones, you should know this. Despite this, you know, uh, he uh, did make uh, very good political gains. Like, not gains, you know, he made, uh, his support base did not shrink too much. Despite the fact that he was lampooned as uh, Modi Kayar, Gaddar, Gaddar, he uh, won almost 45-46% uh, of the seats in the Pakistani parliament. So that shows that there is stomach for India-Pakistan uh, reconciliation uh, in Pakistan at a popular level to a certain extent. We cannot disregard. So, but after that, when Imran Khan came to power, you found Imran Khan in his opening statement after he came to power, telling India that if India takes one step forward, I will take several steps forward. You do one thing, uh, you address Kashmir issue as per the United Nations resolutions, I will come with you. So that was a red herring for India. And uh, Imran Khan, as well as his patrons in the army knew that it is not going to, act, to be acceptable to India. So they started on the wrong foot. And uh, they knew that India is not going to buy this weight at all. So that was designed to uh, basically to communicate to the international community Pakistan's willingness to talk. But at the same time, uh, conditionalities were imposed like United Nations resolutions has to be, uh, will have to be uh, respected. So that knew that that conditionality was not acceptable to India that Pakistan all, all along knew very well. So what happened <clears throat> at the moment after, uh, in, by 2019, there was an effort by Pakistan, by all means, as you know, to, I would say, uh, spoil relationship between India and Pakistan. Like several terrorist attacks were taking place. You see, 2008, I remember, and now coming comes to my mind, 26-11. 26-11 was the day when the Pakistan foreign minister at that point of time, who coincidentally is the foreign minister today, he was at that point of time in PPP, now he's in PTI. Saha Mahmud Qureshi was in Delhi and he was shaking hands with the then Foreign Minister of India, uh, Pranam Mukherjee. And they were deciding to take the process forward. And few hours later, you had Mumbai attack. Same day, you must remember this. And he was uh, bundled out of India, uh, Mr. Qureshi. So at that point of time, uh, we perhaps did not understand it that clearly that the army doesn't want the civilian administration to cozy up to India to uh, relate to India. So ever since you find whenever there was any effort to improve relationship, there was a spoiler attack. Like for example, December 25th, 2015, uh, Nawaz Sarif uh, on an unscheduled trip, he went to uh, Lahore uh, to uh, uh, attend a wedding uh, hosted by uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sarif. And now that was also Nawaz Sarif's birthday. And 
exactly five days later, six days later, on 31st December night, there was the attack on Pathan Court. And similarly, every time you know there was some effort to uh, improve relationship, there was a spoiler attack. You had you know about that Uri attack, you know they 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 also attacked there. So military NCO, the spoilers within the military, I would say to be more specific, they all along tried to scotch any hope of talk between India and Pakistan. So that leads us to Pulwama. So after Pulwama and after the Balakot strike, things happened in quick succession and the, the relationship deteriorated further. And after Balakot, uh, we, we didn't expect this relationship to assume any positivity or to, uh, to go forward in a positive direction anymore. And what spoiled the entire uh, atmosphere further was their reaction to our uh, decision to abrogate Article 370 and Article 35A. So that was uh, uh, something which Pakistan could not digest. At our level, we did it at internal level and we were free to do that we were, we were well within our rights to take any constitutional step, but Pakistan uh, was not going to like it at all. And ever since what they have done, they have tried to reignite this issue. They have tried to take it to United Nations. And uh, now you find greater correspondence between China and Pakistan on the issue of Kashmir. And you know, China's uh, CPEC, which they call a flagship program within their OBOR uh, or uh, BRI, uh, that is something uh, that you know, they are in, in putting a lot of dollars uh, into. And that corridor passes through the disputed territory of Jammu and Kashmir and through Gilgit Baltistan. And that is why China was also very much uh, uh, interested in uh, joining the Pakistani uh, effort to, uh, what do you say, take this issue of Jammu and Kashmir, abrogation of 370 to world capitals. So China was behind it as well. And China-Pakistan nexus became more obvious during the Galwan incident. Uh, I, I, as, a, as a strategic analyst, I would tell you that you should keep your eyes and ears open and try to link up events. Uh, one of the links that I have uh, come to uh, discover uh, is uh, the attack on Handwara in on th 3rd of May, uh, 2019, uh, 2020, and the Galwan incident on 5th May, 2020. And only after two days, you found the Galwan incident coming up. And Handwara, you had uh, the killing of one army major and uh, two uh, non-commissioned officers. So, and immediately after that, you know, you find Pakistani vernacular media coming out with observations that India is out to destroy Pakistan. They are going to conduct uh, yet another round of surgical strikes. So they were sit scared about possible Indian attack. And since that day till today, you find in newspapers carrying this, uh, you know, issue of false flag operations by India over and over again. So. Pakistan is paranoid about a possible Indian attack post Balakot. And China has come to the rescue in the sense that, you know, Galway, if Galwan incident would not have happened at that point of time, possibly we could have taken some punitive action against Pakistan. I do not know. But Pakistan thinks it that way. And that perhaps prompted Pakistan-China access to come up in a way that uh, they showed up in Galwan and the rest is history. We lost 20 of our men in combat. And ever since this relationship is uh, taking a downhill between India and China. So all in all, today we are poised at a moment of history when there is no common ground on which India and Pakistan can come together. In 2021 also in this year, I do not find any reason to hope that there will be any movement forward. Uh, the wisdom consists in keeping the back door alive, back channel alive, talking to Pakistan, talking them out of their obsession with Kashmir, which is not an easy thing to do. It will be a very, very difficult thing to do because uh, somehow over the years, the nation building in Pakistan 
uh, holds Kashmir as a critical element of their national identity. Uh, you know, in fact, the K word in Pakistan is attributed to Kashmir. So we should understand that. And that is why I do not see any reason to hope that this government of Imran Khan, which is led uh, to a large extent by the army, you know, because I think the security and foreign policy of Imran Khan's uh, government is uh, determined by uh, the Pakistan army to a large extent. And uh, they are not uh, too charitable towards India. So they are going to, you know, because a couple of days back only I noticed that they're not tying up with Turkey, they're tying up with Azerbaijan, they're tying up with uh, different uh, friendly countries to wreck up this issue of Kashmir. So they will go on doing it. So when they're doing it, it is difficult to imagine that, you know, we, we can ever talk. So we will not be in a position to take the process of dialogue forward. But I would say that if you were when you were too young, even I was not born then, 1960s, when you look at it uh, uh, closely, 1960s till 1965 war, if we were situated there, post Tashkent agreement, you would have also imagined that during the war, there, will, there is no future for India-Pakistan relations. But we have come through that. 1971 war, after that you would have thought nothing is going to happen afterwards. But we have come through that as well. So in that sense, I wouldn't be too pessimistic, but I'm not too optimistic either. I would say that in the days to come, a lot will depend on how Pakistan refashions its India policy. If it is going to go uh, to the world capitals and uh, uh, cry it heart out uh, on Kashmir, uh, I don't think it is going to have positive uh, vibrations in India at all. So we have to, uh, uh, you know, keep working with our friend, friends in the international community and convince them about our position on Kashmir, our position on Pakistan as well, that we do not wish Pakistan uh, anything sinister. We, we, we wish them well. And uh, especially when this uh, Afghan reconciliation issue is going on, we would like even to work with Pakistan. We should be able to t tell the uh, people in international community that India is not averse to uh, working with Pakistan also on regional issues. So only then I think we can have the international community by our side and who can in turn pressurize Pakistan to behave. And only after it reframes its policy vis-a-vis -vis India and, and discovers a common ground with India to discuss other issues apart from Kashmir with India, I think uh, the relationship can move forward. So there are a lot of issues that we need to do, we have to discuss between ourselves and uh, we have to get started without the Kashmir issue between India and Pakistan. I'll, I'll stay here, I'll st stop here and I'll, I'll take the questions. And I'll, I'll, thank you, I'll thank you so much, sir. Uh, you have covered the whole gambit of uh, India-Pakistan relations since 1947. <laughs> And it is always good to go through the historical aspect of it because every time we learn something new and different dimensions of relationship between these two countries. And since the departure of uh, Nawaz Sharif and Imran Khan government focused <laughs> more on to prove the uh, two, success of two nation theory in the last two, three years. The focus uh, shifted towards more on this aspect that uh, uh, Muslims are in danger in India and uh, not only at the local level, but at the international level also they are raising this issue. So uh, what do you think in uh, 2021 also they are continued to do that because uh, earlier Nawaz Sharif government didn't focus much on this aspect, but Imran Khan is going focusing more. So and how would be the India's response to it? Uh, you mean to say that, you know, uh, India's response to what? Uh, to the, uh, that uh, Imran Khan government is focusing more on the success of two nation theory, saying that Muslims are in danger in India. And uh, we are focusing more to uh, support Muslims and etc. At the international level, at the UNSC or the United Nations. Oh, yeah, and that, uh, I mean, obviously... I understood your question and I also... 
I'm relating it to the questions that I see in the chat box. You know, I also see that I notice a lot of pessimism uh, in the air. Uh, as far as the questions are concerned, people are thinking that you know it, it, it will not move forward. But there is an interesting question that I should start with, then I will take your question uh, along. So uh, there is an interesting uh, question which I forgot to add. You know, when I talked about the complexity of India-Pakistan relationship, when I talked about the sibling rivalry between India and Pakistan, I implied this. In fact, you remember that a couple of weeks before, after this uh, Balakot strike, we opened the Kartarpur corridor. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting. Yes. That you are you are at war at one level, but at another level you are opening the gates. So it is very interesting. You are you are interlocked in a way that you cannot escape each other. You cannot choose your neighbor. Neither Pakistan can choose its neighbors, nor can we. So at the at the policymakers level. That is a realization that you know we cannot escape it. We can escape from the from the facts of geography. You know? So the pressures of geography. So that is there. So you, will, as you am saying that you know, uh, looking uh, 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 if you were there in 1965 September when the war was on and the way it went, you would never have imagined that you know that they, they can swing back to normal. Same, same with 71. 71 was even a deeper scar for Pakistan. So you would have never imagined Pakistan to come back from there and uh, talking to India uh, the way they did in the subsequent years. So there, is a lot, there are a lot of, what do you say, um, uh, speculations about uh, possible India-Pakistan confrontation even the, in the coming days, right? And people are saying there is a combative constituency in India which is coming up, which is saying that we should take POK by force. This is also, also coming up. And a lot of uh, decibels are being wasted on that uh, debate as well. People are saying that uh, we need to talk to people in Gilgit Baltistan, we should own it up, and we should take this process from there on. And if possible, we can also discover we can take advantage of our uh, conventional power and wrest control of uh, Gilgit Baltistan and Azad Jammu and Kashmir by force. So these are several opinions that are being uh, churned out in India at the moment. And at, and at the Indi at the Pakistani on the Pakistani side, there are a lot of talk about you know the need for uh, inciting insurgency in Kashmir because Kashmir is rife for a revolution. We should do that. So these things are there. I do not say they are not there. And uh, what uh, you are saying that, you know, Pakistan's efforts to bring back the two nation theory uh, also is a potential dampener. Uh, that has all been there. Pakistan has always emphasized on two nation theory. And uh, every time there will be a communal riot in India, there will be several columns in Pakistan, columnists in Pakistan coming out with uh, uh, a statement that uh, we, Allah has been so kind to us and he has given us Pakistan. Otherwise, we would have been killed in a united India and we have been, we would have been sacrificed. Uh, we, have, we would have sacrificed our lives for nothing in a united India. So now uh, we have a fortress of Islam here, they also say. In fact, uh, there is, uh, whenever there is, you find some communal uh, uh, haters in India, uh, the Pakistanis go up and say that, you know, you see how Indians are uh, wrongly calling themselves secular. They are not anything but secular. The constitution is only nominally secular. Uh, these people are uh, basically Hindutva forces. They are out to destroy other minorities, other minority communities. So this is going on forever. So it's not new. But Imran Khan's, I would say Imran Khan's, uh, perspective is largely controlled by the army, as I told you, uh, both on the two nation theory on, on the issue of Kashmir. So uh, he is not in a position to take any stance which we will which will show him on the wrong side of the army, right? And the army at the moment doesn't intend to uh, trade a path which would uh, project itself as, a, as an entity which wants friendship with India. In fact, 
the entire salience of the pakistan army in pakistani politics is uh, built up around anti india uh, perspective you know they are the saviors because they regard india and they project india as a predatory state which is out to destroy pakistan which is out to absorb pakistan that is why all this talk about seeking strategic depth in afghanistan that is why they talk about you know eating grass and making bomb and now their efforts to also acquire tactical nuclear devices they want to ensure that they will keep the deterrence at such a level that india will not stage an all out conventional war against pakistan right so uh, the pakistan army knows that they thrive on anti india sentiments in pakistan and that is why the vernacular media of pakistan which is controlled by pakistan army to a large extent not i would say not fully but to a large extent they churn out narratives which are definitely anti india and at the moment it is at its peak anti india propaganda it is at its peak and they have their own way of persuading the people to believe that india is uh, a hostile country and india is not uh, favorably disposed towards pakistan so in that sense now as i look at it you know you may see certain uh, initiatives like kartarpur maybe you know there will be another offer to for hindus to go to hinjla hinjla mata temple in baluchistan who knows maybe katasra's temple in punjab because these are these are being discussed in pakistani media that if pa- india is not secular we should tell them how secular we are if not secular how respectful we are towards other uh, what do you say religions you would remember couple of weeks back you had a, a story in pakistani media that some uh, anti social elements they got into a hindu temple and uh, broke it down destroyed demolished it and immediately after that the supreme court of pakistan took note of it and the uh, so much notice and they have ordered the government to build it up again so this is something you know which was perhaps not uh, as uh, uh, visible as it is today you know it is it is kind of un- unprecedented so in some way pakistan is now trying to show india that we are more mindful of the minorities than you are so in such a context when the 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 two uh, countries are uh, trying to project each other Uh, as almost you know the the veritable other like you know some a country which is different from uh, their own country and their own identity in that in such a situation it is difficult to find a common ground on which to build relationship on and i don't think if they ever have dialogue what would they discuss you know they can only discuss visa relaxation people to people exchanges but even for that also they need to agree to come to the table and discuss because on kashmir india is not going to budge an inch and pakistan at the moment is not going to discuss anything other than kashmir with india so that is how we are uh, situated at the moment right so on the economic front sir uh, uh, we know that pakistan situation is deteriorating every passing day and their foreign currency reserves are deteriorating and most of the money which is coming from china going to the foreign currency reserves and the relationship with the saudi arabia and the ua is not very well at this moment and plus uh, pakistan do not have a regional market access not e- to the central asia not even in afghanistan right now mm-hmm. due to the situation security situation over there nor to iran or not even in india so uh, do you see any optimism that pakistan if they want to stabilize their economy in the future they will uh, try to push for the good relations with their regional neighbors particularly afghanistan and iran and towards central asia you see the political rhetoric that is coming from islamabad persuades me to believe that they will not you know in fact they do not they have the potential to come up as a gateway for india to central asia and they have they can earn a lot uh, you know as transit fee you know pakistani 
uh, I think State Bank of Pakistan had um, in 2002-2001, they had come out with a paper, I'm, I may not be too sure about the date, uh, that, you know, in Pakistan will, lore, uh, Pakistan will earn a lot by normalizing its relationship with India. So, but they have not done that. In fact, uh, the, the most optimistic account was, you know, about 10, 10 to 15 billion dollars a year, they will earn, they will add to their kitty. Uh, but, you know, when you have this antipathy towards India, so deeply etched in your psyche, you know, $10 billion doesn't sound very attractive. You know, you may be having some community like the business community there and some liberal uh, reading hearts who would uh, be open to this kind of an idea. But uh, the uh, ruling elite, uh, both, both uh, ruling and the opposition, the elite, in, elite of Pakistan, may not be too amenable to this idea. And especially the army, as I told you, they do not uh, conduct a cost-benefit analysis when it comes to uh, relationship between India and Pakistan. They don't do that because uh, they do not uh, want to look at it uh, very realistically, very pragmatically. So they want to look at it as an ideological issue, uh, as something which will enable them further in Pakistani uh, political matrix. So I do not see any reason to hope that that will be there. There was a question on uh, the chart box which I noticed is about you know, whether there is a regional uh, cold war, whether there is a global cold war, things like that, and what is the implication for India-Pakistan relationship. I can only tell you that uh, I think uh, he or she has pointed out that you know this US-China relationship is also uh, having its impact and all. I agree, you know, the global, uh, global uh, situation also tends to have some uh, influence on regional politics and India and Pakistan are too globally connected not to be affected by those global currents. And Pakistan is also hooked onto international community um, as much as we are hooked onto the international community in gainful ways. And you know, Pakistan has its relationship with Europe, with the US, and as much as we have our relationship with the US and Europe, and uh, tr uh, trust me, uh, they are as sympathetic towards us as towards Pakistan. You know, they may not, uh, they may not uh, say it in public, but uh, they would also not like Pakistan to uh, go down the hill. Uh, so they, in fact, it is situation located in such a strategic uh, geographic uh, uh, locale that um, I don't think uh, the Western countries would like Pakistan to go down under, uh, to, 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 to lose, lose its moorings and uh, to sink. So there will, the Pakistan will always, have a, will always find a helping hand, uh, not only from China, but also from the West. And uh, these days, uh, as somebody has pointed out, even Russia is reinventing its relationship with Pakistan or redefining its relationship with Pakistan. Uh, of course, to put pressure on India to a certain extent, but that is there. And especially keeping the Afghan situation in mind, you know, Iranians and Russians are recalibrating their relationship with Pakistan. As much as, um, you know, they are open to the idea of having India as a friend. Uh, so we need to be aware of that. You know, uh, I do not think if we fight a war with uh, Pakistan, um, you know, God forbid that shouldn't happen. But I do not think there will be too many people backing us in the war. There will be people jumping onto, um, jumping on both of us to, you know, uh, come to a ceasefire as quickly as possible. And moreover, the nuclear dimension in the relationship between India and Pakistan will act as, uh, if, uh, as an irritant for them. So they would not like two nuclear neighbors to go to war, go, go, go into an all out war between themselves. So we should keep that in mind. So the global uh, situation, the regional situation is not perhaps as uh, conducive also to uh, India-Pakistan dialogue at this moment. You know, there were times earlier, you know, during 1965, 1971, you find the Americans, the uh, Brits, uh, they came coming together and they, are trying, they were trying to impose pressure on us. Uh, if you look at this book by... Um, outside the archives by Y and Gundevia, he clearly outlines, you know, how international pressure came on uh, the Nehru administration to mend fences with Pakistan. 
but at the moment uh, there are pressures but not of that magnitude uh, which would uh, nudge us towards uh, talks with pakistan especially when pakistan has made sure that it is not going to talk to us uh, if india is not going to talk kashmir they are not going to talk to us so in that situation the ball is in pakistan's court it has to come down from that position and uh, express its interest in taking up other issues uh, with india and then only we can have a meaningful discussion and that no anything else thank you sir i think we are time and i have uh, have answered most of the questions from the chat box for that matter i just have two sm- short questions questions yeah like uh, how how do we, how do you see that uh, your voice is breaking yes like uh sir yes your voice is breaking i'm not able to listen to you uh, sorry so sir, sir i think shreyas's network is a little yes uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, sir i have a question which did not get answered till shreyas connects is uh, how do you see the incoming uh, biden administration and especially the stand uh, the vice president of the co- incoming vice president has taken on various issues related to india uh impacting the international community's approach to india pakistan so if you go if you go by uh, the various american commentators one of them is james dobins who used to be obama's uh, point man in afghanistan he wrote a piece uh, some time ago i heard i saw uh, in fact you know uh, as far as this interreligious freedom issue is concerned the biden administration will have will be more outspoken than the previous administration so there will be some pressure on india to put our house in order and we will be uh, hesitant to take any uh, uh, what do you say direction from us but uh, it seems you know the democrats will may may you know either overtly or covertly try to uh, make their uh, concerns felt in new delhi so this is one uh, speculation that they are making and the second uh, they are saying that you know by the administration we will we will try to push india and pakistan towards dialogue you know uh, trump was too undiplomatic and too i would say you know uh, what do you say they he always wanted to get everything sorted out through twitters you know uh, to throw twitter messages this is not going to happen in both biden administration perhaps there will be more uh, Uh, what do you say uh, effort there will be there will be more directed uh, effort directed towards you know take, getting the two countries to talk to each other because by uh, this administration understands that this uh, uh, in the wake of this pull out from afghanistan uh, they cannot afford to displease pakistan altogether so as much as trump also didn't want to do so given their dependence on the, the pakistani uh, intelligence and pakistani army so they would uh, i would say they would like to talk to them they may talk to us also and try to find some kind of a common ground uh, for talks between india and pakistan but as i told you those uh, efforts will be non start will be non starter because uh, i i do not see any reason to hope that pakistan will ever take kashmir out of the agenda and uh, india and i do not also uh, find any reason to hope that india will ever accept their contention on kashmir so they, they they will have to go beyond kashmir and other issues may have to come up uh, we, um, they they may they have to express their readiness to talk about other issues as well so that the dialogue process can move forward so we must remember one thing here that uh, as far as china is concerned us is a friend as far as pakistan is concerned we should remember that us is as friendly towards us as towards pakistan so they have the concerns about pakistan but they would like to keep pakistan on their side so if they want to keep them on their side they will chastise them they will uh, criticize them but they will not antagonize them entirely so that we should keep at the back of the mind because they are bothered about their national interest not ours and we should uh, 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 always keep that in our mind 
Uh, Sayas, you wanted to ask uh, something? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, sir. My apologies that I lost connection no. due to bad network connectivity. Uh, so I just had two last questions. I think one Pallavi is already asked. Uh, the second question I was asking that about the course correction in Pakistan's attitude due to the international pressure from the IMF or the FATF or the other international organizations that uh, we have seen recently, the arrest of uh, Zakir Rahman Lakhvi and Hafiz Saeed. We know that that is happening since last many few years that they arrest Saeed then he gets out. But uh, uh, plus, um, after uh, abrogation of uh, 370 article, uh, most of the Pakistani uh, religious parties did not come out on the street. And uh, most of the agenda have been handled by the government. That is one more. And the third thing is uh, uh, change in the education policy in Pakistan. So uh, there is a link, the religion things. The religious second is they're changing the education system and the third is uh, they are going against the uh, 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 extremist terrorist organizations in the South Punjab. Uh, do you see that the government, Imran Khan or the army is trying to change this extremist religious attitude of the nation or change the national character of the nation state? No, no, and the making more uh, towards, uh, yes, yes, that's my question, sir. No, no, uh, uh, I think, you know, uh, for since 2014, December, they, they are a bit strict on this issue of, you know, taking on the militant organizations, but they are only focusing their, uh, uh, you know, uh, attention on the militant organizations who are opposed to the Pakistani state and the Pakistan army. They are not opposed to the jihadi, so-called jihadi organizations which are focused on India, like laskar e taiba or Harkutul Ansar and the like, Hezbul Mujahideen and the like. So we should uh, recognize that. So they are only opposed to entities like TTP, like Jamaatul Ayar, like laskar e Jhangvi, like um, ISIS, uh, like Al Qaeda. So they know that these jihadi organizations do have linkages with these organizations as well. But even then, they would not like to touch them. There is no uh, operation against Alaska e Taiba, for example. This like, Jakir Rahman Lakwi's arrest, I think it is a hogwash. It is only to befool the international audience. He has been arrested several times, then they, he has been released. He uh, was a person who fathered uh, a child while being in jail. So he was given VIP treatment in jail. So it is known to everybody. And to a certain extent, the lower judiciary in Pakistan uh, is somehow uh, complicit in all this. They also have a lot of sympathy and empathy for these entities, which are, which are anti-India and which want to, um, uh, what do you say, operate in uh, Jammu and Kashmir. So we have to recognize that. So Pak the Imran Khan government trying to change the religious radical environment in uh, the country, I would say it is half-hearted at the most because they only are targeting those uh, uh, madrasas from where you know they find you know all these laskar e like elements are coming out. Uh, and this educational, uh, what do you say, reform, uh, which we get to see, I haven't seen the blueprint, we haven't seen the details, but uh, what I uh, realize is that uh, there is no effort to, uh, you know, strengthen a secular liberal uh, agenda in the mother sars, you know, and a lot of lip service is being given to these uh, reforms. So in that sense, I, 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 I don't think anything is going to change. And especially their attitude towards India and Kashmir is unlikely to change. And there is no uh, reform in that direction. And like, you know, there is no, no, in, no effort is being made to scale down or lower the antipathies 
which are there already in the Pakistani textbooks uh, vis-a-vis India and Hindus. And moreover, uh, the rise of uh, right-wing in Indian politics uh, has made it even more uh, profitable on their part to sell this agenda to the people in Pakistan. So they know that there are many willing takers now uh, for their uh, that narrative that India is a communal state, India is a Hindu right-wing driven state. So they are not going to get down from that uh, position ever. So because it, it, they are finding it politically profitable and they know that people are listening to them when they are saying this. So this, uh, you must remember that um, more than Islam, uh, it is anti-Indian sentiment which is keeping Pakistan together. And they know it and they continue to churn this anti-India sentiments in Pakistan. And now you remember, uh, you, uh, I would remind you of their uh, media position on uh, the recent attack in Quetta. In Quetta, the ISIS killed the Hazaras and now they are blaming it on India. What a masterly diversion. <laughs> India has got nothing to do with ISIS. India has got nothing to do with the Hazaras. But the sea... India in every internal security challenge that they face today. And they very conveniently, they sell it to their people in Pakistan. So that is going to embitter the perceptions about India in Pakistan further. I would say that it is not going to uh, make in Pakistan uh, the 100% the, the uh, anti-India uh, to that extent, because there, is, there are certainly people who know that this is basically an elite imposed uh, point of view. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, for uh, temporarily for some uh, moment, for some years at least, you know, you find this, uh, you, you will find this anti-India sentiment to stay. Thank you, so, uh, thank you so much for your insights on developments in Pakistan. Yes, and I can see here uh, is there any uh, the status quo is going to persist. St I see the status quo is going to persist for another year uh, in 2021. Uh, I, I think I'll just come to the last question that is uh, the de political developments in Pakistan, that is Pakistan Democratic uh, Movement, mm -hmm. the coalition of opposition parties, which is throughout and the Pakistan uh, Pashtun Taf Tafas movement against the army, mm -hmm. uh, and they are on uh, sharing the same stage mm -hmm. in Quetta. Uh, how do you see these developments, and will these developments have any uh, implications for India also? Because whenever there is a political instability. Uh, there, uh, there is something to do with India also that uh, there will be a confrontation on the border areas, uh, on the LOC or the uh, cross border attacks or major terrorist attacks in India or in Pakistan. So, how do you see these developments? No, no, as I told you, when there is a, uh, the, 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 the internal uh, security situation will worsen, so it is likely that Pakistan will try to divert attention away from all this towards India. So there will be um, LOC, cross LOC exchanges. Yeah, there will be um, uh, effort to sneak in more terrorists into Kashmir so that the focus turns uh, away from internal security situation towards India. So that is, that is, that is a given. That is something you can easily predict. Uh, but you know, uh, if you are uh, saying that uh, uh, the uh, PDM and the PTM is going to uh, pose a grave challenge to the Pakistan army's uh, position in Pakistani society. I am not convinced. They may irritate uh, Imran Khan to a certain extent. And uh, I would uh, go to the extent of saying that if tomorrow the army finds PDM uh, finding a lot of popular support in Pakistan, then they will also sweet sides. They will also try to uh, look towards them uh, because they also are in search of popular support. 
you know whenever the people you must be remembering whenever pakistan army has come to power it has come to power at the back of popular support uh, like when nawaz sharif uh, became very dictatorial in 1999 to uh, 1997 1999 you find when uh, musharraf came to power even benazir bhutto i think uh, said that you know it is a day of deliverance or something of the sort so there is always a political support behind army takeover Uh, so if situation becomes very bad i wouldn't rule out the possibility of an army takeover but as things stand today uh, pdm is gaining uh, popularity uh, no doubt about it but we should not underestimate imran khan's support base imran khan's uh, vision has appealed to the youth and they are still with him it's not that you know it's his constituency has disappeared uh, even if he has not performed Uh, there are many instances around the world uh, when um, governments have not performed but the people have voted for them so uh, in in pakistan also sim- sim- similar situation obtains imran khan continues to have um, a large scale popular support and army banks on it so and if you look at the pakistani uh, debates in the electronic media Uh, i would say that the pti interlocutors uh, do come out with a very uh, very good defense of their activities their politics so we should remember that uh, so pdm uh, it is a typical opposition uh, stunt uh, which has been going on in pakistan for years together but it is not of the kind and it is not not of the same quality as we saw during the mrd movement for restoration of democracy during the aul hawks period for example you know at that point of time there was a popular upsurge against the military rule and similarly uh, when musharraf was thrown out the lawyers uh, came out in revolt there was a popular mood uh, against the incumbent uh, regime uh, nothing of the sort i noticed today you know there are people because if you look at uh, imran khan's uh, Uh, political electoral uh, victory it was a very thin margin he won by a very thin margin and i would imagine that that thin margin remains even today he still continues to be respected and revered by a particular section of the people in pakistan and uh, uh, he is unlikely to uh, go away so soon uh, merely because uh, bilawal bhutto and pmln and others have come together it is quite another thing i may um, make a prediction that if the elections were to be held uh, before the scheduled date uh, i wouldn't rule out uh, the opposition coming to power in the sense that uh, imran khan may uh, lose out some seats but it, he will still be a potent force to reckon with and the army knows it and uh, uh, that is why perhaps an imran khan uh, continues to 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 uh, spout uh, such confident uh, rhetoric uh, on the television screens in pakistan today um, and the army uh, continues to support but if imran khan were to lose support i don't think army is going to back him any further thank you thank you so much yeah, yeah, i must I must, also, I, i must also point out about ptm and the ptm is an interesting movement Uh, ptm you know comes uh, pt uh, the pakistan uh, pashtun tahfuz movement uh, it is basically based in the erstwhile fata you know and it has some support amongst the pashtuns but not uh, all the, all the pashtuns like them so they are uh, pashtuns of the fata you know coming out with their own grievances and pakistan is unnecessarily overreacting to their demands i would put it this way if they would have been a little charitable a little more considerate this movement will dissipate this movement will go away go away but unfortunately the pakistanis you know because they are so uh, obsessed with india they continue to invent a link they are to they think ptm is generated engendered by india because ptm has been enabled by india and that is why they almost count them as anti pakistan and anti national if they continue to do do that then they will have a problem on their slaves 
so they will have to uh, you know behave rationally as far as ptme is concerned otherwise ptme is way on its way uh, to become another headache for the pakistani administration whether it is with or without indian support i cannot say but even left to itself it will become a headache for the pakistani state thank you sir thank you so much uh, i know all of us have many more questions but we have already run out run out of time so thank you so much for your time and the insights and it's good to see you after a long time and interact it with you sir thank and you, i just send it over to pallavi thank you very much sir thank you sir thank you so much sir for uh, joining us today and giving us a very uh, from 47 onwards to now a very uh, great overview of what actually is in store for india and pakistan so uh, thank you so much for that and i'll not add anything to my concluding remarks because i think uh, sir said uh, enough and very detailed so uh, again thank you uh, to shreyas for moderating today's session to dr behuria for joining us today and sharing his insights and all the participants with the questions so uh, to, next week session is on india china so continuing these two uh, series and hope to see you then and Uh, have a good weekend everyone thank you thank you so much thank you for having me thank you sir bye bye thank you everyone